Saying that depression is just a chemical imbalance is the equivalent to walking into a doctor's office with a javelin wound and them telling you, ah, it's just a blood imbalance. Now there's a reason why you have a javelin wound, just as there's a reason why you've gotten depressed. And in this video, I want to talk about the universal reason why people get depressed. But first, an illusion. This is a necker cube. In neuroscience, this is what we call a multi-stable stimulus because this is what happens when your brain is confronted with two conflicting orientations that are possible. Being that the cube is drawn rather ambiguously with no visual cues as to which orientation of the cube is true, the brain doesn't just choose one orientation and stick to its guns, it alternates between the two every few seconds. But here's the thing. A Necker cube can be drawn with only 12 strokes of a pen. So the question is, if 12 strokes of a pen is all it takes to create a three-dimensional multi-stable stimulus on a two-dimensional sheet of paper, what are the odds? What are the sheer odds that your life story, with all its millions and millions of variables, has a different orientation? That somewhere along the lines, not everywhere, but at least somewhere, you made the wrong interpretation. Hey guys, so I'm making this video because doctors and therapists, they can tell you when you've gotten depressed, but if you ask them why you're depressed, the only thing they'll tell you is depression is likely brought about by a major life stress event. And the only reason I know this is because I've suffered at least one major bout of depression every single year for the past 15 years. I've also been studying psychology incessantly for the past 15 years. No correlation. But it wasn't until earlier this year that I finally stumbled upon the universal reason of why people get depressed. And it's actually so simple, you won't believe it. Which is why I'm going to show you my work. I'm going to show you exactly how I got there. So how are we going to do this? First, I'm going to give you a table of contents. I'm going to give you the 10 points you got to know for this theory to make sense. After that, we're going to go into slightly more detail about each point. I'm going to connect all the dots for you. So by the end, you can see how rational this idea actually is. So first, number one, what is the brain for? Dr. Daniel Wolpert has a lovely TED talk where he talks about this very concept. And the quick pitch is we have brains for one reason and one reason only, and that's to produce complex and adaptable movements. Uh, the way Dr. Carl Friston puts it, he says, um, if you think about it, there's very little you can do apart from secretion that doesn't involve movement, that doesn't involve moving your body. Talking, speaking, writing, even thinking involves moving your eyes about. The way we interact with our environment is through movement. Our brains are designed to help us move through space and avoid threats. So that's why we have brains. And if you think about it, most species on this planet don't have brains. Plants make up 80% of the Earth's biomass and yet they have no brains in the traditional sense of the word. So that's why we have brains. Number two, what are memories for? We store memories about past events so we can simulate possible futures. Again, to avoid potential threats, to, move, to guide future actions and future behavior, we store memories about what happened in the past so that we can figure out how to best act in the future. Number three, the brain isn't all wired together. The brain is very compartmentalized with highly specific areas sometimes devoted to one and only one function. And we know this is the case by studying patients who've either suffered lesions or stroke. So parts of your brain may know one thing, while other parts do not. So for example, we can all type on a keyboard without looking, but if I put a blank diagram of a keyboard in front of your face and asked you to fill it out with a pencil, I bet you couldn't do it. Just because your fingers may know where all the keys are, that doesn't mean your conscious self does. And Dr. Ian McGilchrist, pretty much the world's leading authority on bihemispheric specialization, makes this point a dozen times over in his book about the divided brain called The Master and His Emissary. He talks about how the two hemispheres of the brain perceive reality in very different ways, quite literally, but that we're not aware of that fact because at a level below consciousness, there's a meta-control center bringing them together. So we don't feel like we're in two realities, but effectively we are, because the two hemispheres of the brain have different goals, different values, different takes on reality. They're both independently conscious to some extent, and if one of the hemispheres is offline due to lesions or stroke, each one of them is capable of sustaining consciousness on its own. There's so much we could talk about on that subject, but the general takeaway is this. Effectively, you have two brains inside your head. Number four, which follows quite nicely, is that the psychological literature is rife with the concept of subpersonalities. All the great psychologists agree that the psyche should be divided up into multiple subpersonalities. They just don't agree on what to call it or um, how many there are for that matter. So for example, uh, Freud chops it three ways, the id, the ego, and the superego. Jung chops it four ways. 
Um, the neuroscientist Neil Seth, he chops it five ways. Um, even Nobel laureate Daniel Kahneman, he has a, um, a schema for understanding the psyche that he calls the experiencing self and the remembering self. So this is all to say that human beings are extremely complex. Brains are very complicated and we're perfectly capable of holding conflicting views in our head that don't make sense. They're not compatible. Um, it isn't that human beings are hypocritical on purpose, more like we have a view of ourselves that's incomplete and we're not transparent with ourselves. Number five, the way we make decisions is by committee. Whenever you choose to do something, you may notice an internal struggle happening inside your head. But what you won't see is all the networks of neurons that are pulling for choice A, while a completely different network of neurons is pulling for choice B. It's very rare that we're ever in 100% agreement about something. So if, for example, somebody dumps us, there may be a portion of us that's actually kind of happy, while the majority of us is really sad. This morning, part of me wanted to stay in bed, while the other part wanted to get out and make a video on depression. Number six, 95 to 99% of your cognition is unconscious. What we're aware of, this tiny synthesis of sensory information happening between our ears, is only a minuscule fraction of what the brain is actually up to. So if you hop on a bike and you go pedaling down the street, you're not aware of the millions of neurons that are popping up in your head hundreds of times per second just so you can balance on a machine with two wheels. You just know how to put your one foot in front of the other. What we're actually aware of at any given moment is just a tip of the iceberg when it comes to the world of the brain. That said, there are conscious properties to consciousness, and there are unconscious properties to consciousness. And most of the learning that shapes our behavior doesn't come from a lecture or a book. It's subconsciously worked out. So if, for example, you go to a buffet and you get sick, let's say you uh, eat some bad shrimp and you get sick like four hours later, it won't be you that has to work out that it was the shrimp that got you sick. Your body will unconsciously learn that association even if you don't want it to. And you may forever have an aversion to shrimp that no amount of conscious reasoning can talk you out of. A lot of how we learn is through trial and error. Our brains take statistics on what works and what doesn't, and this is precisely how you first acquired a language. When you were like two years old and you were first learning English, it wasn't in any top-down or conscious way. It was completely bottom-up. And even now, you may not be able to articulate where commas go in a sentence, but you'd notice if one was out of place. And the same could be said about um, certain words we've never looked up the definitions before. You may not be able to consciously articulate what the definition is, but you'd notice if someone used the word incorrectly. This is all to say that not all knowledge is articulable and conscious. Number seven, the default mode network is the most likely candidate for the ego we've ever seen. There are now numerous, numerous studies that suggest that whenever you have overactivation in this network, you either have depression, anxiety, or both. So what is the default mode network? Among many things, the default mode network is involved in self-referential thinking or autobiographical thoughts. So unlinking from the present moment and thinking about ourselves, mental time travel. Uh, the neuroscientist and Neil Seth uh, describes depression in three words. He says depression is repetitive, ruminative, thinking. Not bad for a three-word description, but what the hell does rumination mean, right? So rumination is replaying an event over and over in your mind's eye. So kind of like a mental self-flagellation, people who get depressed tend to replay that stupid thing they said or that stupid thing they did or how worthless they think they are. They replay that in their mind over and over, over and over, engaging in these negative recursive feedback loops of which they cannot seem to escape. All this is underpinned by a hyperactive deep elbow network, or in plain English, an inability to stay in the present moment. Number eight, the body contains an unimaginable complexity and intelligence. I'll put it this way. There's not a single one of your ancestors on your direct line that failed to survive and reproduce. For at least the last three and a half billion years, every single one of your ancestors on your direct line had what it took to survive, and all that genetic knowledge is now sitting inside your genes, inside the body your genes built. We're not aware of how we grow our arm hair, or how we digest our food, or how we repair the tiny rips in our muscles after we work out, or how we generate immunological responses, and we don't have to be. Much of what we're able to accomplish in this life piggybacks on the intelligence of the body and the unconscious mind, and we have to at least acknowledge that fact. Number nine, the Iowa gambling task. This is hands down one of my favorite studies ever done because it is so interesting. And the way it works is basically you have a subject and you have an experimenter. 
and the experimenter sets out four decks of cards. And the subject is instructed to just draw from the decks and win as much money as possible. But what the subject doesn't know is that the cards aren't random, they're rigged. Each one of the cards either gives them money or it takes away money. But the subject has no idea about the rules of the game. They're just trying to win as much money as possible. At the very same time, the subject is hooked up to a galvanic skin response, which measures tiny changes in the sweat glands in their skin. So it's kind of like a lie detector. Now it usually takes the subject around 20 to 30 cards to consciously work out which are the most profitable decks. But here's the kicker. After only 10 cards, the experimenters start to see a spike in the galvanic skin response, indicating that the unconscious mind has already worked out which decks to avoid. And then, 10 or 20 cards later, the conscious self works out which decks to stay away from. What this means is, is that our physiology always, always, always plays a part in our decision making, even when we think it's all top-down logic. Number 10, a revised, modernized interpretation of the multiplicity of selves living inside your brain, aka the subpersonalities. In its simplest form, when you start to divide up this psyche, you have the conscious self and the unconscious self. From Nobel laureate Daniel Kahneman, we're introduced to the idea of the remembering self, which is to say that there is a division of the unconscious that's always focused on the past and what happened. And if you consider its opposite, you get the future self, a division of the subconscious that's always focused on the future. Wishes, wants, plans, desires, hopes, dreams, expectations, reciprocity, consequences, potential. All this is contained within the future self. And the best way I know how to describe the future self is to picture an app on your phone. The future self app. So this would be a monitoring app that keeps tabs on not only what you say, but also tracks your movement through space. I think we all know when we're giving in too much to our impulsive side and we're not living up to our full potential, which leads us to the inevitable conclusion about what depression really is. Depression is your body's way of telling you something is wrong. Nietzsche once said, thoughts are the shadows of feelings, always darker, emptier, and simpler. And what is depression? A feeling an intuition. You don't know what it is, you just know something's wrong. You don't know why you feel so bad, you just know that you used to have motivation for this thing and now you don't anymore. You used to love life and now you don't. But if you sit with that feeling long enough, you start to intuit where the depression came from. I'm depressed because I smoke too much weed and I don't know how to stop. I'm depressed because I'm working a dead-end job and I know I can do better. When you're not living up to your full potential, you know it. You know it, your friends know it, your parents know it, and if you actually come across someone who respects you enough to tell you the truth, they'll tell you to your face, you're not what you could be. But even if they don't, it actually won't matter because your body will let you know. It'll send you a message. It'll say, hey, you're choosing from the wrong deck. Hey, I'm warning you. Just like the Iowa gambling task, your body will let you know when one of yourselves is out of alignment. You know, I used to think that lying was all about telling lies, but it isn't. Uh, lying can be something that you act out with your body. I didn't know about this until I started reading and uh, watching Jordan Peterson, but, and what he basically said was, if you know there's something you should do and you don't do it, that's a lie. Or if you know there's something you shouldn't do and you do it anyway, that's a lie. It isn't the kind of lie you say with your face, it's the kind of lie you act out with your body. If I know that I shouldn't come home and eat three meals back to back, but I do it anyway, that's an enacted lie. We know the brain can simulate future movements, which is precisely why you can't tickle yourself. We know that intelligence is sometimes defined as can a thing make predictions. We know the body is extremely intelligent. So why is it so crazy to think that the body can do exactly what it was designed to do? In other words, why wouldn't the body be incredibly adept at projecting and analyzing future movements based on past actions and then projecting that into the future? Which is all to say that the future self has already crunched the, all the numbers, it's already run all the data, and it's saying, hey, look, I've, I've done the math on this, and I know where you're headed, and it doesn't look good. And so I'm not gonna participate in this negative spiral anymore. When your actions stop reflecting that you actually value yourself, your body tells you. And it tells you in the only way that it knows how, which is depression. 
If you or someone you know is depressed, try considering the idea that depression is your body's way of telling you something is wrong. You're not getting enough food, or you're not getting enough nutrition, you're not getting enough sleep, you're not getting enough um, job fulfillment, or life fulfillment, or emotional fulfillment, social interaction, sunlight, whatever it is. Or maybe you're getting too much of something. Maybe it's too much food. Maybe it's too much sleep. Maybe it's too much of some negative behavior pattern you don't want to talk about. You know, I once had a serious problem with uh, stress eating or binge eating and I uh, had to go see a specialist. And um, he also happened to be a former monk. And uh, he told me something that I'll never forget because he said, there's basically two paths in this life. There's the path of pain and there's the path of listening. Most people, he said, choose the path of pain because they're unwilling to accept that they could be wrong or that they're headed in the wrong direction. And when you stop listening, the body stops talking. In the West, I told him, we call that the silent treatment. And I was kind of half joking at the time, but the more I think about it, the more it makes sense because people who have depression no longer have enjoyment or motivation for the things they once loved. Their body is no longer giving them those feel-good neurotransmitters like serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin, endorphins. All those feel-good chemicals that make you feel alive, that make life worth living, provide the echo of experience. Well, when you get depression, all that dries up until you wise up. The body is saying, I don't like your actions. I don't like your direction. And I'm no longer going to participate until you get out of this negative spiral. That's depression in a nutshell.